My name is Suzanne Fritz. I'm the genealogy librarian specialist and I hope that um, I encourage you to do your family research and that you get a lot of great ideas and tips from today's program. Um, we're going to talk about finding Mexican ancestors, recommended resources, and research tips. No, Getting sorry. started. You want to begin with yourself and work your way backward in time. Um, it's, it's a little difficult to try to pick a famous person and go forward. So what you want to always do is start with yourself, go back to your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. This way you'll get success. Um, you want to find out as much information as you can um, by interviewing older family members. And you want to gather information from family scrapbooks, Bibles, and photographs. What are you trying to find? You're seeking each ancestor's information. You're looking for the date and place of birth, the date and place of marriage, the date and place of death, children's names, birth dates, marriage dates, etc., and military service. Ideally, you're trying to find all of this information for each of the ancestors in your family tree. Having said that, for some ancestors, it'll be really easy to find a lot of information, and for others, it'll be more difficult. So that's normal, that's okay, um, but just persist. This is our photograph of the Fort Worth Public Library, the genealogy unit. Uh, we're located downtown at the library at 500 West 3rd Street. Uh, right now, due to, the, due to the coronavirus COVID restrictions, we're not open for you to come in, but you can contact us through email uh, by calling us, and we're more than happy to help you um, with this research project or any research project. Okay, Mexico, research tips. What you wanna do is study the history of the place where your family resided, identify which records were created by various jurisdictions over time. You wanna investigate those records, and then you wanna focus your search on records pertaining to your ancestors specific location and time period. And that's really the key because you'll see that various jurisdictions can change um, the types of records um, will depend very much upon the time period, what is available and what is not. This is our library website, um, fortworthtexas.gov slash library. And you can click on uh, genealogy, local history and archives, our link. And you'll see here we have all sorts of databases um, and great ones, but you're going to want um, the genealogy databases. And um, I'm going to show you Ancestry to begin today. Ancestry Library Edition. It's the world's most popular online consumer genealogy resource. There's more than 7,000 databases within it. Um, including all different record types such as census, vital records, immigration, military, family histories, and other documents. Hundreds of millions of names are represented and there's U.S. and international coverage. So what's nice about Ancestry is purely the sheer size of it. Um, it's one of the largest and so this will be your best bet if all you know is someone's name and then finding further information that will help you. It includes um, census and voter lists, birth, marriage, and death records, military service, immigration and travel, and there's international coverage. And in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, that's what we're going to look at today, and specifically Mexico. 
So here is the first screen for Ancestry. You can click on Begin Searching. You can also explore by location. So here, I, I, there's an interactive map and I've brought up the page about Mexico. You can click on any of those um, pinpoints for more information. And you'll also see that um, today we're focusing on Mexico, but Ancestry has coverage from many countries throughout uh, the world. And all of the states of the United States, all 50 states. And over here, you can see when you click on Mexico, just some of the, the, the breadth and the depth of what's there. There's baptisms, there's the national census, uh, select marriage indexes, uh, select deaths, uh, Hispanic surnames and family histories, um, historical postcards. So a lot of really, really great um, information and sources for you. The card catalog, that was the partial listing. Um, if you want to see the full listing of what's available, the card catalog is where you're going to go to see that. I just typed in Mexico and then you're going to get a very comprehensive listing and it breaks it down by category, which is really nice too. Um, it shows you what's new, what's been newly added, and that's something that's nice about Ancestry is they're always updating the database and adding more to it. Um, but on the side, you can see there's all sorts of categories about the census, the military, immigration and travel, um, even pictures, stories, histories, all sorts of great things. Uh, what I want to start with today, though, is the civil registration records for Mexico. Uh, this is really a great place to do family research. Uh, the civil registration comes about uh, beginning in 1859. The Mexican government uh, starts requiring that births, marriages, and deaths um, be recorded by the civil authorities. These are then recorded on the municipality or district level and there's very broad coverage of the population, which is estimated at 90 to 95%. Now, they begin this process in 1859. It's strictly enforced um, beginning in 1867. And that's when you're gonna see, you know, better to full compliance. Um, in addition to the civil registration, you can use church registers alongside of the civil registration. And I'll show you that later on. Now, this is an example. This is in Ancestry of Chihuahua, Mexico, the civil registration for marriages. Remember how I said they required that these be recorded. Um, the database covers 1861 to 1967. Um, for more recent, you would have to, you know, contact them there. Um, and my search result, though, for today, we're going to be looking at Juana Gonzalez. And with this, you always want to start by entering the information you're most certain of. In this case, what we know for sure is her name. Um, so that's what I'm putting in. Okay. And then I look and I have all of these results for different Juana Gonzalez. And you can browse through the list uh, to locate the one that would appear to pertain to your ancestor. Now, the one we're interested in is this Juana Gonzalez. And her registration or marriage place is going to be in Riva Placio, in Chihuahua, Mexico. And you'll see that the registration um, of the, the, or the marriage date is the 29th of March, 1937. So this is when she's registering the marriage. And what's nice is that you get further information. We see her spouse, uh, Fernando Lopez, but it gives us 
further information. It gives us the name of her mother, um, Guadalupe Nieto, and the name of her father, uh, Francisco Gonzalez. So just by looking at one record, we've already learned a lot about her. We've discovered the name of her spouse and the name of her parents. And this will help us with further research. This is the example of what the civil registration record actually, actually looks like. Um, and they're all sort of written, it's an entry that's composed in the same format. So even if you don't speak Spanish fluently, that's okay. Because once you've gone through a few of these, you'll start to see that the way they were entered, um, the entries follow a pattern. So you'll know where to look for her name, for the name of the spouse, for the name of the parents. It all sort of follows a uh, standard format. So don't worry if you can't speak Spanish fluently um, because what you're really looking for are names and dates. Now, if you're not certain as to, and if you speak Spanish or read it fluently, that's wonderful. But if you don't, don't let that um, be disheartening. You can ask a friend or someone who does, what do you think this name is? How do you believe it would be pronounced um, if you can't quite figure it out on your own? And a lot of times the Spanish it's written in might be an older or a more old fashioned Spanish than what's you know, spoken today. Uh, so that's another thing to be um, cognizant of. Okay. Now the select church records. Uh, so th that's the civil registration. So that's when people are recording uh, births, marriages, deaths to the civil authorities, as I said, on the municipality level. Now, of course, they're going to the church to have all of these um, events, records such as baptisms, confirmations, marriages, marriage intentions. So this is when you want to um, bolster your civil registration research with church record research. Um, and this database is the select church records uh, from 1537 through 1966. So as you can see, we've got a civil registration beginning in, you know, the 1850s, the 1860s. Now you're going to find church records going back much, much farther to the 1530s. So this is really going to help you further your family history research. Um, it contains Catholic parish records from 29 states in Mexico. And as I said earlier, you know, think about the types of records that your ancestors were creating. Um, the baptisms, the confirmations, the marriages, and that's what you'll find in this database. And in my search example here, uh, my search person I'm trying to find is Alicia Fernandez. And here we go. I've got all of the, these different Alicia Fernandez uh, to choose from. So this is the advantage of Ancestry is that you literally can just put in someone's name and you're going to get a lot of choices to further review to figure out which of these could be my family. Okay, the one we're going to look at today is Alicia Josefina de Jesus Fernandez. And this is from the church records. Uh, they gave information about her. They gave her gender. Uh, we see she's a female. Her baptism date is the 6th of October, 1928. Um, it shows the place of baptism, which is gonna be very helpful because now you know where the family is at the time of her baptism in 1928. So now you know um, where they are. You can look for other family members and extended family in that same locality. And we know that her mother is Leonor Fernandez. 
the baptismal record is dated October 6th, 1928. And again, it's a standardized entry. And same advice as earlier. You'll see that these entries tend to follow a specific format um, with the baby's names, the mother's name. And so you're just really looking for names and dates. Okay, now those are some of the um, electronic resources. I also wanna share that we have a print collection at the Fort Worth Central uh, Library. And even with the restrictions that we have in place right now with the coronavirus, you can always email us at, at Jen LHST, so G E N L H S T at FortworthTexas.gov, and we'll try to help you as best we can with any of your research questions. The print resources that we have within the unit. Now, these are not all pertaining to Mexico. This is everything. There's over 40,000 volumes with an emphasis on Texas, an emphasis on Southern and mis Midwestern states, uh, the 13 original states, family history books and local histories. We have genealogy magazines uh, where you can find a lot of great articles uh, for how to do your genealogy research, um, great tips and resources. Uh, for internet uh, genealogy, all sorts of great magazines, and lineage society books. Uh, for the international collection, it is slightly more limited, limited materials on foreign countries, with an emphasis on Great Britain and Western European nations. Also, Mexico and Canada are uh, represented and we are actively expanding our international collection. So for several years now, we've been looking and have been adding more to these areas. To see what we have, what books, you can do that in our online catalog um, from our library website. And all I did was type in Mexico and genealogy and you're gonna get a list of every book we have in our genealogy unit pertaining to Mexico. Um, the first one that came up is uh, Mexican American Genealogical Research Following the Paper Trail to Mexico. So in addition to all of those um, resources and records to find those pieces of factual information, we're gonna have how-to books that can help you and guide you through the process. Uh, so the librarians are here to help. We have books that are here to help. You can um, check the availability to find the location of the book. Now, they're going to be at our uh, downtown location, but here we get a call number, 929.1 Schmall. And I also see that this book is at East Regional. Since it's a how-to book, this means you can check out this book, bring it home, go through it, and um, give yourself some good ideas for your family history research strategy. Right now, the libraries are open on a limited service model. You certainly could place a holds request for this uh, through our online system, and you could obtain a copy of this book through the curbside pickup. That's because this book is circulating, it checks out. Those, the big print collection that I showed you at the Central Library, that's not gonna check out. That you'll need to email us, but we have others at branch locations that you can borrow. Okay, now another website I wanted to show you for your family history is familysearch.org. Uh, this is the one that is put out by the LDS Church. It's a great website. They have a lot of information. It's not quite as large as Ancestry, but we always recommend cross-checking. So you want to take, a, take a, a look in Ancestry, put in your family ancestor's name, and then you can cross-check in Family Search um, because these types of records that they have, while similar, are not exact duplicates. Okay, so here's their historical record collections for Mexico. You'll see they've got baptisms, deaths, marriages, right? So they've got more of that. You'll also see they have the national census, 
which is I'm going to show you today. Um, and in their catalog as well, you can get an idea for the different records they have. Now, the National Census um, is a, a great resource as well. Earlier attempts were made uh, to enumerate or to count the population of Mexico. Uh, the 1895 census for Mexico is considered to be the first federal census there in Mexico. Beginning then in 1900, the census was conducted every 10 years. So the earlier attempts were made. You finally get the first federal census in 1895, and then beginning in 1900, they're every 10 years. They're arranged by municipality and then by place. So city, village, ranch. The 1930 census is the fifth census. And what's important about this is that it's the only one that's available to the public. So this is the one researchers can use. Um, the originals are kept at the Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico City. So the 1930 census in Mexico, um, I want to search for an ancestor and I put in his name as being uh, Juan Alcón. And here he is in 1930. And we get quite a bit of information about him. Uh, we get the household members. Um, we see where he, he is living. In, he's in Durango, uh, that he's male. Um, his age, he's eight years old. His birth date is then interpreted to be 1922. And the head of the household is Pedro. So we can assume that Juan's father's name is Pedro. And here is what the actual digitized image looks like. And we can see Juan along with his dad and the household members in 1930. Um, so there's a Lorenza. She's uh, let's see, six years old. So in addition to one, we see there's a younger sibling in the household. That's the federal census as was taken by the Mexican authorities in Mexico. Well, now we have the US federal census. So at some point in time, um, the family is going to emigrate from Mexico to the United States. And 1940 is a great place to begin uh, research for ancestors who are in the United States. Um, why 1940? Well, it's the most recent year available. So this is the, the, the best place to start because it's the most recent. Um, what's nice about this, again, is that it's going to place your ancestors and their family members in a specific location at a specific point in time. It will enable you to locate an entire family group, and you can check out the neighbors um, who might very well be kin. It would not be unusual for the families to be living um, near other relatives, near other cousins, etc. Okay, so the United States Census in 1940. Um, so I'm going to be looking in this search example for Pedro Hernandez, whose birthplace is Mexico. And that's what I know of him, so that's what we're going to put in our search box. Here are all of my search results. So I'm going to get all of these various matches for Pedro Hernandez. The one who we're interested in for today, though, is going to be this one who was living in Tarrant County, Texas in 1940. So here we have Pedro Hernandez, um, the census taken in 1940. Uh, Justice Precinct 6, it just means that 
he is within a um, census district or justice district number six within Tarrant County. Um, his place of residence is given as Fort Worth. We see his age is 39. He's married. Um, his birth year is estimated to be 1901 and his uh, birthplace is estimated to be Mexico. And in addition to him, we're going to see his household members. This is why I said the census is so wonderful, uh, because we're also going to see uh, his wife, Janito, a daughter, Esther, a son, David, and another daughter, Lupe. So now we can see the entire family uh, together, their ages, at a specific point in time, which is 1940. This is what the original census page document looks like. And um, one of the nice things about um, the 1940 census is that the census takers really asked a lot of questions. You know, where are you living in 1940? Where were you living in 1930? Um, they wanted to know if people were working because the country had just come out of the depression. Are you working? What is your usual occupation? Are you working full time? How many hours? Um, about what was your salary? So you really get a really great snapshot into the family's life at that particular point in time. Okay, so now that we have all of this information. Um, we've looked at the United States federal census. We've looked at the, the Mexico national census. We've looked at the civil registration. We've looked at the um, church records. And hopefully through all of that, we found a lot of ancestors' names, uh, their dates and places of birth, their dates and places of marriage. Well, now that we've got all of this stuff, what do we do with it? Um, and there are charts and forms that you can use that are standard that are going to help you keep all of your valuable research organized. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is called an ancestral chart or a pedigree chart. Uh, this is fairly typical. And the way this works is you're just going to um, if you were to begin with yourself, you could put yourself in the first position on the chart, and then you would put your father in the uh, tree just above you, uh, your mother to the tree below you, and then you would do your grandparents, and then you would do your great-grandparents. So this is gonna allow you to keep all of those generations in one place on one form. So you're putting yourself here, your father, your mother, your father's mother, your mother's mother, their parents, etc. When you get to the end of the chart, you can take that person and put them into the number one spot and keep going back. Now with family history research, don't worry about filling in the chart perfectly. What you're trying to do is just add more and more information to it. So with some ancestors, you're going to find every piece of information, it's going to be perfect. You're going to know exactly when they were born, where it was, when they got married, to whom they were married, uh, where they passed away, uh, the names of all of their children, if they had military service. You're going to find everything, and it's going to be great. Other ancestors can get quite tricky. You'll, you'll know where they should have been, their name, roughly who they were, but it can be tricky to find out specifics, and that's normal. So don't let that discourage you. You know, within every family, there are always ancestors where it's easy to find information about them and others, for whatever the reason, it's just very, very tricky. Um, but that's why you just wanna keep the tips in mind, go through some of those strategies like I told you, and just try to find out as much as you can. This is a family group sheet. What's nice about this form is that it enables you to keep nuclear families recorded all in one place. So um, essentially you can put the name of the husband, the name of the wife, 
um, where they were, you know, born and where they were married, and then the names of their children. So it, it's easy to keep the different family groups um, separated. So let's say the man has more than one wife. For this form, it's just one family group. So you would put the husband, the first wife, and their children. If there's a second wife, you do another form. The husband, the second wife, and any children they might have. Uh, likewise, um, with the um, wife, she might have had more than one husband. Or if they're not married, that's okay. Just record it to the best of your factual ability. But you want to put her name, uh, the name of the father, and the name of any children. That's for historic families, which tend to pretty much follow this pattern. Uh, with modern families, there can be many, many more options. And the computer programs allow you to enter all sorts of great information. Um, you can put, if it was a wife and a wife and their children, um, you would want to put their information, where they got married, the names of any children. You can allow for um, adoption. You can allow for if there was a sperm or egg donor. You can even allow for whether the parents were considered friends and uh, not married. So that's the, uh, the modern uh, forms um, within the uh, software packages really enable you to expand your research options. I'm showing you an example of a you know, historical form that would be appropriate to these historical time periods that we were looking at today. But uh, don't let that uh, stop you with your family research. The goal is to accurately record things. And if any family members are still living, you just want to keep their information private and not uh, publish it. You know, things that you would publish and put online about families should only pertain to uh, family members who have passed away. Okay, now, I know you guys will have lots of questions. I've given you a lot of information. Um, so you can email us, as I said, at that genlhst at fortworthtexas.gov. But I also want you to know that there are research aids that you can access online. In fact, Ancestry Library Edition has an entire uh, library of great research aids. Um, everything from getting started to the census to beyond the basics. So you're going to have a lot of options in this way. Um, and so, you know, if I mention the census and you wanted to find out more about that, just go to the census category. Um, if you want to find out more about Mexico, uh, put in Mexico and you're going to see um, a lot of information. Okay, now, since we are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, my presentation today focused on Mexico. Um, and there's so much more, obviously, to Hispanic Heritage Month, so many more places um, everyone's ancestors could have hailed from. And I just want you to know that Ancestry has resources uh, for many locations around the world outside of the United States and Mexico, including Spain, Puerto Rico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, um, then there's Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay. So there's so much I couldn't obviously talk about every single country for Hispanic Heritage Month, um, although I would have loved to. But the same search strategies that we've applied for Mexico can be applied to any of these countries, right? The basic search strategies. Um, interviewing all of the elder family members, finding out what they know, um, identifying records for your ancestors' specific place and their time period, using the 1940 
um, US federal census as your starting off point for United States research. Uh, this is always a, a good strategy to employ. And I also want to point out, it, you know, it's not just Ancestry Library Edition, Family Search has record sets for all of those places as well. And I want to encourage you um, that all contributions to your family's history and genealogy are worthwhile and rewarding. So as I said earlier, don't worry if you can't find every perfect piece of information, just try to do your best, find what you can, and I hope you uh, really enjoy uh, your family research quest. Uh, that concludes today's program, and I believe they may be sending out a brief survey. If you would take the time to fill that out, that will give us some great information uh, for our programming purposes. Uh, thank you. And they're telling me that the survey will go out tomorrow. Suzanne? Yes. Susie Ibarra wants to know, are there maps to show the families on the census? Not exactly. There are maps that will show the census districts. So what that means is like, let's say Fort Worth, and then they'll break down Fort Worth into smaller districts, um, enumeration districts. And there are maps that can show you enumeration districts which will include what today we might refer to as zip codes. In this instance, they're called enumeration districts. So you're going to see that. You're not going to get a comprehensive listing of which families are living in which um, census districts, and you're not going to find a census map showing families, if that makes sense. Yeah, I see a question. Uh, what if you don't know exactly where in Mexico a family member comes from? Is there a way to distinguish one uh, Juan Gonzalez from another? Um, that's a pretty common name. And that's going to be also an issue uh, with any name, John Smith. Um, so sometimes, no, you really need to know the location. What I would recommend in that instance is researching um, lateral lines. Uh, so pick someone with, in the family with a more uncommon name and trace them and then look at the household members. Uh, but this can be very challenging, you know, um, even let's say for a John Smith in a small county in Virginia, there could be three of them in that time period. So there could be you know, three Juan Gonzalez's in one small town in Mexico at the same time. And so this is why you need to look at the other family members. And if you don't know their names, families often exhibit um, naming patterns. You know, they're naming the son um, in honor of the father, in, or they're naming a daughter in honor of a grandmother. So names are gonna repeat within families. I would look for that as well, and that will help you try to figure out, you know, your Juan Gonzalez versus someone else's. Okay, Susie had a couple more questions. She wanted to know where you would find the districts in the library or on Ancestry. The enumeration districts, uh, they're going to be, um, I honestly would look for them online at the National Archives is my preferred resource. Um, I would go to archives.gov and they're going to give you the enumeration district maps. So rather than looking for them in the print books here, I would go online to archives.gov. And then Linda in the chat was asking um, where she should research. Her great, great grandfather was found on the 1900 census in Arizona mm -hmm. and he was from Mexico, possibly from Sonora. And she wants oh. to know where she, you can probably see that in your chat there. Let's see. Um, he was from possibly Sonoro. There should be a border crossing. Um, he was born in Arizipe, Mexico. I'm able to find any record 
with his name, birth christening church. Could be a few different names. Um, you might have to search a few different areas, but there should be a uh, border crossing record of the family. Um, and I would look, I'm trying to think where I saw this. It may have been at Cindy's list, but the other thing people can do is that families and ancestors tended not to do things um, different than what other people were doing. They, they tend to follow groups and you have certain trails that were taken. Um, so you wanna look to see, you know, if an immigration trail, let's say it's going from Sonora, Mexico into Arizona, um, that's gonna be, we'll call it more of a common migration route. And these tend to draw uh, families from certain geographic areas for specific reasons. Um, and I think I saw that on Cindy's list. Ancestry, I know has a, um, they have a specialist genealogist that was talking about the Arizona um, Sonora connections. Ancestry may have information on that as well. Does anyone have any more questions? Okay, well, that's it for today. I wanna thank everyone for coming out.